She was newly married, ready to begin her honeymoon with the man that she loved. And all it would take to stop her plans forever was a sadistic friend and a single cup of coffee. My name is Adrian, and welcome back to Coffee House Crime. Speaking of coffee houses, today's case unfortunately takes us to one, one which became the crime scene to one of Indonesia's most notorious cases in 2016. Okay, so this case did conveniently fit the channel's name, but that's just a coincidence, I promise. Just to let you know, I post both solved and unsolved cases here on a weekly basis, so if true crime is your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffee House Crime. So pull up a seat, grab a coffee and sit back. This is the case of Myrna Salahin. Today's case takes us to a new location on Coffeehouse Crime's map, Indonesia. Indonesia, which is the world's largest island country, is located on the equator and has over 17,000 islands within its territory. And its capital, Jakarta, sports a population of over 10 million residents, rewarding it with the title of a megacity. Known to be one of the best cities in Asia for nightlife and shopping, Jakarta is also the economic nerve center of the Indonesian archipelago. Manufacturing, banking and tourism are all critical industries here. Putting it short, Jakarta is thriving in the modern day world. But it's easy to often look at things with a lens too wide. For millions of people in Jakarta, it's just home. Myrna Salahin was one of those residents. Myrna was born on the 30th of March 1988, along with her twin sister, Sandy. Both Myrna and Sandy had a typical childhood while growing up and in her teens, Myrna would grow an interest in design, an interest that would direct both her and her career path moving forward. And with an opportunity to undertake her academic qualifications abroad, she decided that she would undertake that degree in Australia. With Australia being a well-respected and reputable country for academic studies, it lured her to the city of Sydney, and the weather would have been sure to persuade her too. It was for this reason that Myrna found herself in Sydney's Billy Blue Design College in the year of 2007. Being an international student to the area, Myrna was keen to find other Indonesian students that she could bond and become friends with. And she very quickly found herself getting to know multiple other foreign students, including Hani Boon, Arif Somako, and Jessica Wongzo. With incredible weather, vibrant nightlife, and an amazing beach scene, Sydney was great for the four. But fast forward four exciting years later, and for the group of friends, college was finally over. Amicably, the four went on in their own separate ways. After graduating, Jessica stayed in Sydney to become a permanent resident in Australia. But for Myrna, Hani and Arif, they all went back to their home country, Indonesia. In 2014, three years after graduating, Myrna decided to go back to Sydney to revisit her former footsteps. It was during this time that she caught up with Jessica. People change over the years, for better or for worse. Sometimes it doesn't matter, and people just end up no longer being compatible with each other. And it seemed that that was the case between Myrna and Jessica. They went to a restaurant and then ended up arguing. Myrna told Jessica that she didn't approve of Jessica's boyfriend, and told her to leave him. But this really angered Jessica. So much in fact that she stood up and left Myrna halfway through the meal, leaving Myrna to pay for the entire bill. Jessica's and Myrna's relationship deteriorated. In fact, it ceased to exist. While Myrna returned to Indonesia, back over in Sydney, Jessica was suffering with her life in numerous ways. Over the following year, and through to 2015, she spiralled into a world of depression. She was actually hospitalised five times over the course of the year, and tried to end her life on numerous occasions. It was during the same year of 2015 that she started abusing alcohol and friends of Jessica reported her going off the deep end. She now seemed to be miles apart from the bright and goofy personality that she once used to be. On the 22nd of August 2015, Jessica's alcoholic abuse would go up a notch. It was 2.20 in the morning when she was driving, under the influence. While speeding through Marion Street, located in Sydney's suburb of Leichhardt, she lost concentration and crashed into a building. While Jessica survived, it did come at a small cost. 
She had broken two ribs and sustained an injury to her chest in the crash. And she faced multiple fines too. Jessica would make a full recovery, and luckily she also didn't cause any harm to anyone in the nursing home that she'd crashed into. But the car crash would be sure to highlight her mental well-being to both her friends and her family. And if that wasn't embarrassing enough, she would also lose her job four months later on the 1st of December. Also being a student at Tibbley Blue Design College, Jessica was a graphic designer for New South Wales Ambulance. And although it's not known why she was fired, it can very likely be guessed why. Meanwhile, back in Indonesia, things were going the opposite way for Myrna. After moving back to her home country with her boyfriend, things became more serious for the two. And in November 2015, just weeks after Jessica's crash, Myrna and Arif Somarko travelled to Bali to marry. The wedding was beautiful. Both families were among dozens of friends who watched on as the two expressed their love to each other. But despite the large crowd of friends, out of everyone there, Jessica was not. Hearing the news that her once best friend Myrna married without giving her any invitation seemed to enrage Jessica. She was still angry at her for the awkward confrontation a year prior, and now she had been dumped and forgotten about. Things were obviously not going well for Jessica. She had become depressed, lost her friends, crashed her car and lost her job. In fact, all of this was just too much for her. Deciding to face her problems indirectly, she decided to leave Australia and head back to Indonesia to escape from all the chaos. Allegedly in text messages to a friend, she said, I could use the money to have an epic holiday, rather than giving money to those ignorant police c**ts. I'm being pushed again and again. I'll break. Her trip back home had other advantages too. Sure, she was not invited to Myrna's wedding, but maybe she could meet up with her and bridge the rift that had grown between them in the last year. And so on that note, in late 2015, Jessica boarded a plane in Sydney and headed back to Indonesia. Just two days after arriving back in Jakarta, Jessica reached out to Myrna. She asked her if she wanted to meet for coffee. Myrna was apprehensive about meeting Jessica alone. And so her husband, Arif, suggested that maybe she could meet Jessica with another friend. And so Jessica accepted the invitation, with a mutual friend Hanny invited too. The three agreed to meet on January the 6th at 5pm, at a coffee shop within one of Jakarta's busy shopping centres. Unlike their previous get-togethers, Jessica decided to buy drinks for the group. Myrna and Hanny shrugged it off and said that they'd buy them when they get there, but Jessica insisted. A little strange, but the strangeness didn't stop there. At 3.30pm, an hour and a half before the trio were expected to get together, Jessica arrived at Olivier's. CCTV captured her entering the cafe's front doors before taking a seat. But only two minutes later, after briefly scouting the area, she left. And 42 minutes later, Jessica returned, now carrying three shopping bags. The shopping bags were from Bath & Body Works, a shop located only two minutes away, each bag allegedly holding a small bottle of soap. Jessica then proceeded to walk around the restaurant for several minutes, suspiciously looking up towards the walls and ceiling. And at 4.15pm, still 45 minutes before her friends were expected to arrive, Jessica then ordered one iced Vietnamese coffee for Myrna, and two cocktails for herself and Hani. I'm taking just one minute from this story to share with you what exactly a Vietnamese coffee really is. We can't just skip past coffee on a channel like Coffee House Crime after all, especially when that detail is so crucial to the case. So what exactly is a Vietnamese iced coffee? It's a special kind of coffee that, first of all, replaces milk with condensed milk a much sweeter and thicker substitute that eliminates the need for any sugar. If you normally take a spoon of sugar in your coffee, then start at the quarter of an inch of condensed milk. And once that's in the cup, you then will need a Vietnamese coffee filter to help drip your coffee. This is known as a fin in Vietnam, and you can pick one up almost anywhere. I grabbed mine from Amazon for £7. You will then need to tamp or press your coffee down into its filter. The idea of using a fin is that the coffee brews incredibly slowly, 
which in consequence makes a stronger and smaller coffee which resembles a thicker, more caffeinated espresso. Once that is done, just place your fin on the cup and pour boiling water straight into it from here. Technically, you can add more water for a second time, if you like your coffee large. The slow process drips well over condensed milk, or alternatively, ice. Surprisingly, coffee was only introduced into Vietnam in 1857, by a French Catholic priest in the form of a single coffee arabica tree. And now, not even 200 years later, thousands of coffee farms exist all across the Central Highlands, and have become a popular icon around both Vietnam and Indonesia. Leave a comment below if you enjoyed this short coffee tutorial, and if you try making one yourself, let me know how it goes. Once all water has dripped into the coffee, you will notice that the coffee and the milk will usually have separated, so go ahead and mix it up and enjoy. The more you mix the condensed milk, the sweeter it gets. And finally, on a hot day, you can let this cool down and simply add ice to make it an iced Vietnamese coffee. Back to the story, Jessica's actions were already a little strange at this point. Ordering drinks 45 minutes before her friends were expected to arrive was already a little odd, but more was yet to come. Over the next 45 minutes, Jessica placed her three shopping bags on the table, almost like a wall to block off everybody's view of the drinks. It's difficult to tell what exactly Jessica is doing behind those bags, as she's also, conveniently, in a surveillance dead zone but clear movement of the drinks is noticed several times from the faraway camera. At 5.16pm, 50 minutes after their drinks had been delivered, Myrna and Hanny finally arrive at Olivier's. The two greet Jessica, hugging her before sitting down at the table. And within the very first minute, Myrna takes a drink from her iced Vietnamese coffee. Just two seconds later, she appears agitated. She began to fan herself and cough. And then she complained that the drink tasted funny, before gesturing it to Hanny and Jessica. They both declined to try. And not even one minute later, Mona lurches her head backwards and collapses in her seat. The weight of the situation turns from strange to terrifying. She starts convulsing and frothing at the mouth. Both staff and customers around Myrna rushed to her aid, worried and panicked. And as Myrna's health nosedives, both Hanny and Jessica watch on. But this is where others start to notice Jessica's strange demeanour. Almost instantly, she starts to accuse the coffee shop of tampering with Myrna's coffee, asking them what they'd put in there. Reactively, the coffee owner took Myrna's drink away to potentially analyse it later, just in case. Myrna was rushed to a nearby hospital only one mile away, but tragically, in the five minutes it would take for her to reach its front doors, Myrna passed away. Her husband Arif, he was rushing to be by his newlywed wife's side, but by the time he reached her, she was gone. The love of his life, only weeks after they had married, was dead, and two of her closest friends were there to see the whole thing. On the day that Myrna died, Olivier had only served 10 cups of Vietnamese iced coffee, and out of the 10, no others had caused any sort of reaction. It was good that the coffee shop kept Myrna's drink, because police picked it up and took it in for forensic analysis, analysis which three days later would confirm that that coffee had cyanide in it. It was then noted how ironic it was that Jessica was the first one to accuse that the drink had been spiked, at a time where there was no suspicion or doubt and actual evidence against Jessica began to slide into place over the following days. On the 10th of January 2016, just four days after Myrna's death, an autopsy on her body found bleeding was evident in her stomach, as were traces of cyanide, those traces directly corresponding to that found in the coffee. Cyanide is a chemical compound that will kill a person within minutes if ingested. The chemical prevents cells from deriving energy from oxygen, causing rapid death. It attacks the central nervous system and cardiovascular system extremely effectively, and its main systems include agitation, seizures, and vomiting. Police investigating the coffee shop's CCTV would also highlight Jessica's strange behaviour before, during, and after Myrna's fate, and this strange behaviour would also be noticed during Myrna's funeral. 
Jessica seemed emotionally constipated. Day by day, suspicion was growing over Jessica's head, and with Indonesian police knowing full well that she was a permanent resident to Australia, they were worried that she could flee anytime soon. It was for this reason that, with the evidence they had against Jessica, they were very careful at piecing it together. But on January the 30th, 2016, they finally arrested Jessica on suspicion of premeditated murder. Myrna's trial would start four and a half months later on June the 15th, but before they'd get there, several new details on her case would be realised. Detectives would eventually interview Jessica's former manager from her graphic design role at New South Wales Ambulance, named Christy. She had a supervisory position over Jessica for eight months, and in that time, she got to know Jessica very well. She observed how Jessica had a nasty attitude, a general abundance and hatred, and a strong strangeness. And when asked if she could imagine Jessica being a violent person, her manager responded with, I have no doubt that Jessica is capable of hurting or killing another person. Christy went on to tell police that Jessica once told her that she knew how to poison and kill someone, if she ever wanted to. And if that wasn't damning enough for a testimony already, she then admitted that Jessica once threatened her with her own life, saying, you have to die, and your mum should die too. The Australian Federal Police were next on the list for Indonesian investigators, who wanted to know more about Jessica's history back in Sydney. Questions were initially raised on if such information should be made available to Indonesian authorities. But with murder holding the death penalty in the country, Australian and Indonesian officials came to an agreement of sharing information in exchange for a promise to disqualify the death penalty in any verdict. The Australian Federal Police released reports that detailed Jessica's attempts to take her own life four times, two of them requiring hospitalisation. They also revealed that she displayed threatening behaviour towards colleagues, was in a major alcohol fueled road accident in a nursing home, and finally, she also had an apprehended violence order taken out against her by her ex-boyfriend after he found his car vandalised shortly after them breaking up. And while the police stated that Jessica was suspected of the vandalism, there was not enough evidence to charge her for it. Jessica's trial, which started in mid-June, would become a public spectacle that dragged on for a long total of four and a half months. During trial, her defence argued that the AFP reports which Indonesian officials used in their investigations should have never been shared by Australia, and condemned Indonesian authorities for using external chatter as evidence in their courtroom. But prosecutors would strongly argue that the AFP reports, which highlighted her aggression, death threats, alcoholic abuse and attitude, did nothing but confirm the already obvious behaviours of Jessica Wongzo. Ultimately, prosecutors would focus on the CCTV, which showed a very concerning trail of clues that suggested Jessica spiked Myrna's coffee. And to back up their claim, toxicology reports would also confirm that cyanide was found in Myrna's body. There were many other damning clues that were highlighted too. Jessica insisted that she ordered the coffee. She appeared to search for CCTV before sitting down. She didn't place the bags next to her, but on the table around the coffee. She bought the drinks excessively early. She even at one point seemed to peer over her shoulders before reaching into a handbag and appearing to make movement over the area of the table which contained the coffee. She then refused to try Myrna's drink showed little sign of panic when Myrna was convulsing, and even seemed to be happy in almost every public recording since Myrna's death. And there were many opportunities to seem upset. There were, however, two very vital pieces of evidence that were missing to this case. The first is that there was no actual evidence that slipped cyanide into Myrna's coffee. This could be because Jessica was never actually questioned or taken in on the day of Myrna's death. But to make the story even more complex, it is confirmed that she threw away the trousers that she wore on the day. One other piece of missing evidence was how Jessica actually got hold of the cyanide. It's a tricky substance to acquire almost anywhere in the world, but especially in Indonesia. Both of these arguments were at the forefront of Jessica's defence. Because in short, the court had no evidence of her in possession of cyanide, and had no evidence of her putting cyanide into the coffee. But despite those two vital highlights to the case, enough evidence seemed to suggest that she killed Myrna. Because on the 27th of October 2016, Jessica Wongzo was officially found guilty of the murder of Myrna Salahin. Menyatakan terdakwa Yesika Kumala, alias Yesika Kumala Wongso, alias Jet.
telah terbukti secara sah dan meyakinkan bersalah melakukan tindak pidana pembunuhan berencana. Mona's parents cried out at the verdict, praising God for finding her killer guilty. Jessica was sentenced to 20 years behind bars, and with thanks to the AFP, she evaded the death penalty. Judges described Jessica's actions as vile and sadistic, expressing their disgust at a lack of remorse. But judges also agreed that Jessica was young, and that there could still be hope that she would rehabilitate and fix herself. Saying that, upon hearing the verdict, Jessica immediately told the court, I cannot accept this verdict. I feel that it is not fair. Before being handcuffed, then led to a prison cell to begin her 20-year sentence. Whether you personally believe in life sentences or the death penalty, 20 years behind bars seems relatively short. Short when compared to the years taken away from Myrna Salahin. Being in the middle of what should have been the happiest moments in her life, she never actually made it to experience a honeymoon or anything that would have followed. Children, a successful business career, grandchildren, and countless happy memories along the way. All of this was taken from her. And for what? Greed. Myrna was an upfront and honest person, deeply affectionate with her friends and her family. She was described as the most wonderful person that Reef had ever met, a woman who had an amazing outlook on life. A life that was abruptly ended at 27. Friends and family of Myrna still can't believe that she is gone. The abruptness of this case is almost as staggering as the fickleness of Jessica's motive. And following Myrna's death, her widower Arif has now moved back to Australia to start a new life in Melbourne. And while it's not known how well he is doing, I'm sure that we all wish him the best in his future. Thank you for watching another video today by Coffee House Crime. If you found this video interesting, or if you learned something new, then please remember to like the video and subscribe. In the recent few days, England has experienced a heatwave, which means right now I'm recording in 32 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to stop on this note and probably jump in the shower. But thank you again for watching. But if you do have any thoughts or opinions on the case, then please leave them in the comment below. And as always, I'll be right here behind this camera waiting for you in the next one. Until that moment arrives though, look after each other. Goodbye.